But look, other stories doing the round, and it started, I guess, um, when the wealth tax issue came up, and a few wealthy New Zealanders I knew said, I might just bugger off. I might just bugger off overseas. Then we look at immigration statistics, and a lot of New Zealanders, once we, we ended the fortress mentality, started going across the ditch to Aussie. And in the last few weeks, we've had uh, Mark Ellis going to Italy. We had a big uh, property investor, a real estate guy in Auckland, um, announce he was going to Sydney, I think it was. And then a lady who makes wallpaper says she is off to, um, to Aussie as well. And I noted this weekend a very good column, uh, and he's written a few good columns uh, from insolvency expert and media dilettante, um, Damien Grant. And Damien wrote about, well, this malaise, why people are leaving, and they clearly are. He did a little bit of analysis on the age cohorts and asked a much bigger question than this is, is this because Labor's the government? Is this because this country is somehow losing its mojo? And I'm very happy because it's been some time uh, to have Damien Grant join us uh, by video link. Look, I was really taken with your column this weekend because I got the feeling that you were looking maybe wider than just party politics in New Zealand and asking a question about where the country is at. First, do yeah. you think there's any doubt we are losing people because of the state of the country uh, rich New Zealanders and productive New Zealanders and young New Zealanders are leaving. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any doubt. You have. You have a look at the data. There is a a, a loss of population, and the and the really big drop in population is those in their twenties. It's, it's very noticeable when you have a look at the data. There's actually a slight increase in people in their um, in their thirties. That does appear to be a result of incoming migration. So. There's actually a net migration of people coming in, um, but a lot of it, but a lot of those people are people from, you know, people economic migrants, you call them, um, uh, coming from countries that are that are at the moment poorer than New Zealand and moving to New Zealand. And it'd be interesting in the in the fifties and sixties, people in Singapore may have wanted to move to New Zealand for economic opportunities, um, but they certainly wouldn't now, would they? Mm. So, Damien. The media tends to focus on the big names, on the Mark Ellis's, on, on, on the, I don't know, the high rollers who decide to leave New Zealand. You're saying this sort of group in their 20s who I presume have energy, have ambition and provide, if you like, some, some real dynamism to an economy and to a society. Which group are you more worried about? Your Mark Ellis's? Or your twenty-eight-year-old, I don't know, nursing graduate or economics graduate. Well, I, I think it's definitely those who are younger, and particularly when you consider that we pay a lot of money to educate um, doctors, nurses, engineers, um, and lawyers, all the rest of them. Sparkies, mechanics, you know, plumbers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not so sure whether we need to worry about AUT journalism grads, but but nonetheless, these people are, you know, we we spend a lot of money to educate these people. Then they sit there, they look at their 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 life earning potential, and all of a sudden, cripes. The the income delta between here and Australia at the moment is about 25 to 30 percent. Now, some people pointed out that you know there are some higher taxes in, in Australia at a, at a high level, but when you are being paid twenty to thirty to forty percent more over the over your lifetime, that's massive. So if you're twenty five, why would you stay in New Zealand? That doesn't make any economic sense. You are going to be a lot richer if you spend your life working in in, in Australia, and that's the reality. And I don't see how uh, at the moment we're going to uh, that we're going to compete, and that's a real challenge for a potential incoming government, not just to to tinker around at the margins, but actually change the the dynamics to get those people to stay. Yeah, Damien, I think your column also sort of touched on this issue that we do in New Zealand become very very focused on the three year political cycle, right? And uh, you you vote in a new government, it's going to change the world. Maybe it's our attitude, despite who the government is, that needs to change, and we kind of need more of a plan. 
Well, yeah, and it's interesting. John Key, when he was elected, had a plan to catch up with Australia, and he, he got uh, Don Brass and, and Bryce Wilkinson from the Initiative and um, Honourable David Cagle and, and one other to say, hey, let's look at our policy settings and see whether we can catch up with our friends across the Tasman. And I think they did one or maybe two reports, and, and, and John Key ditched it because, you know, he has no political courage. He didn't want to spend any capital on that. And the sole reason that he was in office was to, uh, was to you know, kind of look good in the Northern Club and set himself up for a post-political career. A massive and catastrophic wasted opportunity. As hard as my concern is that, Will the, will the new government come in potentially, as you say, we need a plan, look at setting a plan in place that will survive a change of administration? It's important. So we need a long term, a, a long term strategy on this. We we do, and and it was interesting. I went to the to Ireland with the initiative, and. They've been working on some of their policy settings for 20, 30 years, and it's, it's paying dividends now, but that's how long some of these re-engineering processes can take. Yeah, Ireland's a good comparator for us because they have a big neighbour next door. Uh, they have a population that is uh, kind of comparable to ours. Some would say a culture that's quite comparable to ours. But they made some big strategic decisions on tax, for example, and the tax status of overseas companies, which have paid off over the years, you know, but they said you don't have to pay a lot of business tax here. They get a whole lot of uh, um, IT. And, is it Microsoft that's in, in Ireland and uses Ireland? So they really made big strategic decisions. Are we in a position to make game-changing decisions like that? Are there any game-changing decisions we can make, Damien? Oh, there's no there's no shortage of game changing decisions that we could make, but we would need to go back to the mindset that we had between eighty four and eighty nine. That the decisions that were made then were were truly transformational and set us up for all of the economic success that we, we've had since then. Uh, it, but since Ruth Richardson was fired, every decision has been in the wrong direction. It has been for an, uh, an increase in taxes at every level, an increase in regulation, a reduction of free trade, and and you know you look at the Resource Management Act, you look at the, look at the Building Code, all of these things. The um, Overseas Investment Office. You were talking about Microsoft investing in Ireland. Mm. Microsoft couldn't invest in New Zealand in the same way because they probably couldn't get through the uh, Overseas Investment Act. They couldn't buy land in New Zealand. It's too sensitive. Yeah. All right. Why aren't you leaving? Um, well, if this is the logic of it, Damien, if you see this economic wasteland, why aren't you packing up your bags and moving across the ditch or to Singapore or something? Because I, like a lot of people, including yourself, Sean, um, we have an economic network and a skill set that is geographically specific. I have an insolvency license. I have a business. I have networks, and I'm simply, you know, too old to to move across the Tasman. It will take me five to ten years to to reestablish the networks and the connections that I that I have here. Um, and by then, you know, I, it's, I'm old enough now uh, without having to, to, to start again. And look, I, I do all right, and I don't have enough wealth that, that um, Marum and Davidson could tax me very hard anyway. So for me, it doesn't make sense to move across the Tasman. But for my son, it certainly would. Mm. Uh, do you think our media need to look past the headline stories about the brain drain, which is the high-profile people or the people... You can say they're a millionaire or they're, they're, no, they're some entrepreneur. Um, or do those, are those stories useful in highlighting the issue? I think they are useful in highlighting the issue. Um, you know, the stories of Mark Ellis and so forth, uh, decamping, uh, I think that tells a story. But I think the more powerful story is, so these are people with capital, right? And so if you've got capital as opposed to a profession, it's, it's easy to move that, that capital somewhere else. The, it's the untold story 
it's the it's the engineering graduate, the Sparky. Those people are the people who are leaving. That's the that is the untold story. That is the real economic loss that we're suffering. And uh, to be fair, I think the media do cover it from time to time. But I mean, the media are about big stories. Something like that is a is, is a slow burn. Yeah, that's right. And it's an insidious story, and it just creeps up on you. The other thing, I guess, I was just thinking, Damien. And you, in your column, you, you kind of focus in on this age bracket. Um, you know, twenty-eight year old, mid twenties, probably you're like a dog. You've probably become useful. You're well trained. You're growing up a bit, and you're super productive and you're full of energy. I mean, you know, you get to forty, it's it's all downhill from there. But it is kind of important that that's where energy comes from, and not just in an economy, but also in a society and a culture. Um, people of that age are really going for it and really dynamic people. A- and it feels to me like we almost have this donut effect. We've got a big hole in the middle where stuff should be happening. And it's the people who are leaving and the people who are staying. So the one thing, because we're looking at the stats data, the one thing I, you couldn't tell was, you know, of the, of the 36,000 people in their 20s who left in that period, who were they relative to those who decided to stay? And that's that's really that would be really interesting. Mm. Of those those thirty six, how many of them had tertiary qualifications or trade qualifications relative to those who stayed? Mm. If you're to be blunt, if you're not very good, then New Zealand is probably a relatively attractive place to be because we're going to look after you. If you if you fail in New Zealand, you'll be fine. If you can't afford a house, the government will give you one. And if you don't even pay that rent, housing New Zealand is not going to not going to kick you out. If you commit a crime, it's fine. We won't send you to prison for very long, and we'll do a cultural port, and then we'll, we'll have a hui, and and and, and it, will all, it will it will be fine. But if you're the sort of person who wants to make three hundred thousand dollars a year and, and and build a house and get a business and get a family going, well, you know the problem in New Zealand is that we want you to pay for the guy who doesn't want to work, who doesn't want to earn his own house, and who 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 feels that he should not be forced into the indignity of paid employment because he is in some way special. So it's the guy with the degree, with the with the entrepreneurial spirit, that's a guy that's gonna stay. That's a girl who's gonna who's gonna leave the shores. And yeah. that's a you know and I and I think So does know, the rest of the world years, I'm just looking for analogy. Are we like Palmerston North? <laughs> Stop hating on Palmerston North. No, I don't John. <laughs> I love Palmerston North. <laughs> it's a great place to visit, as they say. Um, <laughs> but are we see increasingly seen as a backwater? Yeah, well, you know, they talk about all the billionaires who want to come here, but, I mean, the billionaires who want to um, uh, to come here, they're not coming here for the uh, business opportunities, are they? They're, they're coming here because I think... Because the they're they doomsday they're cultists. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, so so we're a, we're a, we're a sheep farm and a ski resort, and frankly, in fucking Papa, we we can't even get the ski resort going. And if global warming turns out to be true, we won't even be a ski resort. Yeah, me, what are we going to so do? Don't, don't worry about that. So, Damien, this isn't uh, a change of government isn't going to fix this overnight, is it? Well, if the next government is anything like the last national government, no, um, it will probably continue to make things worse. Um, what, but mind you, it's interesting, right? So I, I had a couple of national MPs text me or message, private mess me after that column. Certainly I know the ACT Party want to do radical things and there does appear to be at least a couple of people in national who want to do radical things. So maybe, maybe this, this, this next government can actually set and train as did David Longy and uh, as did Roger Douglas and Richard Preble, maybe the next national government can set and train something that will last beyond that administration, but, you know, we'll see. And I've got to give you the plug. Where can people read this excellent column that got you on here this morning? Um, uh, stuff. Stuff.co.nz. Search for Damien Grant under Perspectives and, and there I'll be. Yeah, good stuff. Hey, lovely talking on here, Damien. Hope we can do it again soon, my friend. Thanks, Sean. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, That is Damien Grant, columnist for Stuff. He's also an insolvency expert, runs an insolvency business, um, and uh, is also on a podcast with our mate Bomber Bradbury called The Working Group, which is a, uh, a name they nicked off me.